idea where my powder proof is. Well, it's not here. It's not here. It's not under there. Not up here. Are you kidding me? I just found it. I'm gonna use a brush. But you're in a wheelchair, Blanche. Hi, and welcome to Murder's a Drag with me, your host, with the most, Aura Van Dank. All of those things is me. That's me. You're listening to Aura. This is Murder's a Drag. Welcome. So, again, this week I had another case that I couldn't pass up researching immediately. J.D. Doyle, the source from the previous episode that I told you guys about, suggested this case, which also took place in Texas in the 80s. It's great. I, it has everything that, that I look for in a case when I'm researching, so I had to jump on it and I had to research it. The murder of Patrice LeBlanc in Houston, Texas in 1986. A wild story, a wild ride. I got most of my information from a book. I actually had to get a collection of books to get this story. It was called The Infamous Drag Queen Killer uh, with stories by Catherine Casey about the drag queen killer. Uh, and that's where I got 99.9% .9 of the information from this episode. The pictures and everything, all of that great information, again, comes from J.D. Doyle's archives, HoustonLGBTHistory.org. So J.D. messaged me the link to this story on his website about a high-profile drag queen in Texas who murdered her partner. She was in a heterosexual relationship, and she murdered her girlfriend. Uh, it was wild. This story is wild. Her name was Brandy West. Like I said, she was really high profile. She was known for doing kind of crazy shit on stage. She was known for her quick wit and being a mean person on the megaphone, her insult comedy, if you can call it that. It was just mean though, it wasn't very funny. People didn't find it that funny, but it did give her like this infamous title. In 1986, that infamousness, that's probably not the word for it, changed to murderer on the run who had stabbed his girlfriend 39 times and dumped her body in a lake. She was only 20 years old, like a baby. Brandy West, or John Clifford Ewins, was born May 22nd, 1954 in a suburb of Houston called Memorial, full of really big houses, rich people, it's very bougie, very pretty. Today they're all really modern looking, but obviously his parents were really wealthy. His dad was a regional manager at Whirlpool, the dishwasher company, and like Watcher and dryer and refrigerators. Frigiators? I think that's what Whirlpool does. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm thinking of Maytag, the, the commercials with those guys that turn into washing machines. John Clifford Ewins went by Cliff. He grew up privileged, wealthy. You get the picture. By the time he got to high school, though, he was pretty geeky. He was a theater nerd, but he wasn't really picked on or anything because it was a rich school, so there were a lot of other theater nerds there, too, because they had been to Broadway shows and their family was swanky. Cliff was super close with his sister, who helped him dress up as a girl for Halloween when he was nine, just like the rest of us. Tragically, she died at 15 in a car accident, and that kind of <laughs> with him. As soon as Cliff got to high school, he got involved with the drama department and theater at, like, every opportunity that he saw. You know, theater kids are pretty gay. And when he got into theater, he discovered that he was bisexual. He was attracted to both men and women and began pursuing both men and women. As soon as he really tapped into that queer side of his identity, he was off to Montrose to see the gay bars and the scene that was growing out there. And he met drag queens out there and was immediately taken aback by the glamour and the attention that they got and, you know, drag queens. Cliff actually made friends with a few drag performers when he was really young and brought them home to his parents' house, to which his mother said, get that freak out of my home. So they were not super supportive of the identity. During his junior year of high school, Cliff started working as an understudy in a production of The Boys in the Band, and he was playing in the props and costumes and put himself together a little number and came out dressed as Carol Channing, giving his best Carol Channing impersonation. And when his co-actors saw that, they were like, you need to do that at opening night. We dare you to come out in full Carol Channing drag to opening night. And that's exactly what he did. Being already pretty familiar and acquainted with the nightlife in Montrose, Cliff didn't really have a problem getting gigs, and he came up with the name Brandy West because Brandy was glamorous and West was simple, which I guess were the guidelines for making a drag name back then. Glamorous first name, simple last name. I don't think that I fit that criteria. In an interview with Catherine Casey for that book that she wrote about the murder, Cliff said, A lot of the bars had drag shows and it was quick money. I liked hiding behind a mask. 
As me, I was plain, and drag, I was glamorous. Aren't we all, Brandy? Aren't we all? About four months before he was supposed to graduate from high school, Cliff actually yeeted his parents' credit cards and ran away to New York. He was there for about four months, trying to make it as a famous actor, and he ended up dancing as a go-go boy at a gay club and hated it so bad that he moved on back to Texas, continued doing drag there, and trying to act around the Montrose area. That's when Brandy started to quickly become known for that um, insult comedy and cutting humor. She actually compared herself, she said that she's a combo of Joan Rivers and Don Rickles. Okay, that's definitely not what I got from her, because Joan Rivers was funny. One of the queens that used to perform with her, speaking of not finding her very funny, said that it was almost as if Cliff had a split personality. Like, Cliff was a very sweet person. Well, a sweet person, and Brandy was just mean, and every time that she went on stage, that person said that somebody always ended up getting hurt. And Cliff said to Catherine, because he's a little bit of a sociopath, that he wasn't into practical jokes, but the other queens said that he would split seams in the back of their gowns so that when they would go out on stage it would just tear. He used to um, take Queen's wigs off while they were on stage. He was just not a very nice drag queen. Even though Cliff didn't explicitly say or admit that he struggled with his gender identity, it was pretty clear to me that he did. I think you guys will agree. Because on and off, Cliff took hormones, you know, like hormone therapy hormones, to transition and started growing like noticeable breasts and grew out his hair very long, but insisted throughout all these interviews and throughout his entire life that he identifies as a man and that he goes by Cliff and that's what he wants to be called, that's how he wants to identify. So, you know, who am I to say? But it was clear that back then, at least, he wasn't quite sure or was just messing around with hormones. Maybe that was a thing back then? I'm not sure. Cliff also underwent facial feminization procedures. He got cheek fillers, he had a chin surgery and a nose job. So he was making himself to where he would pass as a female during the day with very light makeup, and he was living his life basically as a female full time. Every time that Cliff saved up enough money from doing drag and working weird jobs, he would shoot right back up to New York and try to make it there as an actor again. So he came up with this idea that he was gonna create this character and convince everybody that this character was a real person, like social security number, birth certificate, real person, and he named her K.T. West. And this was his alter ego. She was a famous actor from New York that was coming to Houston in the Montrose area to act and work there. But it was Cliff. After all the work that he had done in New York, he came back and people didn't really recognize him, so it worked. And he's also a sociopath, so it worked. KT ended up doing a lot better than Cliff did and landed the lead supporting female role in this weird spin-off of an older women's prison B movie and this was called Women Behind Bars, which is a good show on Netflix now. This was a dramatic play that KT was in. She met this friend in the cast named Mary Hooper who started to get a little bit suspicious of KT because KT was not who she said she was. And when she found out that KT was actually Cliff, Cliff claimed that he was trans gender and undergoing a sex chain surgery. So Mary Hooper, being the ally queen that she is, kept it a secret and actually became friends with KT at the time. And they got really close, closer than KT was with anybody else on the cast. Cliff was literally living his life as a completely different person. Cliff told Catherine Casey, the author, regarding KT, I knew KT would die a natural death from the start, but it was a real task to see if I could pull it off in front of people who knew me as both Cliff and Brandy. So he was literally having the time of his life playing this character, fooling everybody into thinking that he was a real person when he is not. Catherine had the same thought that I did, like maybe Cliff is like really suppressed transgender person and this is like his, his real identity, but he can't come out. Like she questioned that and Cliff said, it was always me, it was always Cliff underneath it all, enjoying the artistry of pulling it off. So he was adamant that he identified as a man, that he's Cliff, and that all of these things that he did were just a character that he was playing to fool everybody. As Mary Hooper, his fellow cast members, started to get closer to KT, they were doing the staged slapping scene where KT was supposed to do one of the like numbers on stage, but kept actually smacking Mary in the face very hard, like leaving marks, leaving bruises, and Mayor was like, bitch, what the Please stop slapping me in the face like this. You're not supposed to actually slap me in the face. And KT said, sorry, it wasn't me, like Sybil or something. Like Catherine Casey brought that up and Cliff even denied any thought of that. The stunning Miss Gay America 1985, Miss Naomi Sims, had 
many similar things to say about Brandy West. Naomi said, Cliff thought about it a lot. The differences were important to him. How can you be so terribly outgoing most of the time on stage and off you're just this small little guy? I was never asked at the trial if I believe Cliff killed Patrice. I've never told anyone this, but everything violent Cliff ever did was as Brandy. I never thought it was Cliff who killed Patrice. I always figured it must have been Brandy. What a strange thing to say, but like reading in this far into it, it makes sense because people genuinely thought that Brandy was like a split personality evil queen. In 1980, surprisingly enough, Cliff started up a ridiculously toxic relationship with a man who wanted to remain anonymous, so he went by the alias Jimmy. Every time that Jimmy would try to leave Cliff, because Cliff had cut him off from his friends, was isolating him, all of the textbook signs of an abusive relationship, Cliff would hunt down Jimmy, and he even kicked an apartment door down one time trying to find Jimmy and bring him back. And in the summers of 1983 and 1984, Cliff, or Brandy, had this huge summer-long gig both summers in Providencetown, which is like the neighborhood of Massachusetts. That's when her career really started to take off and her name, Brandy West, started to mean something in more than just the Montrose area. At this point, Cliff, for Brandy, meets Waylon Flowers, who is this like random coked out puppet guy and Waylon introduces Cliff to cocaine and Cliff is immediately addicted and just starts this crippling downfall into cocaine and welcome to the 80s. At this point Brandy was building her career off of champagne and cocaine puppets so things were getting kind of weird. However it was the 80s so cocaine just meant that her career flourished. She became one of the Fab Four which was a group of four drag performers who were considered the best of the best in the Texas and surrounding area, and she was one of those, along with Miss Naomi Sims, Miss Gay America 1985. Obviously, this was a group of very prestigious drag queens. They had all made names for themselves, and were all on a lot of cocaine. So that really amped up Brandy's stage game, both the notoriety and the drugs. And one time, she was doing a Baby Jane number, and I guess the plan was to like push like her co-star out of the wheelchair on stage and then do the whole, you know, that scene. What she actually did was like rolled this queen all the way to the front of the stage and dumped her off the stage and said, but you're in a wheelchair, Blanche. <laughs> My own impersonation just got me. In late 1985, Brandy and Jimmy's tumultuous, crazy-ass relationship was over, and as abusive sociopaths tend to do, Cliff had remained friends with Jimmy. And Jimmy introduced Cliff to his good friend, Good Judy, Patrice LeBlanc, who had just moved from Lafayette, Louisiana? Is that where that is? I think it's in Louisiana. So Jimmy met Patrice one night while he was out clubbing at a gay club, and Patrice uh, had a very similar upbringing to Cliff. She was born in Lafayette, Louisiana, and she was also born to a pretty swanky, rich family. Grew up privileged, had everything she wanted. Her first car was an Audi, so that should tell you that. And she just loved to have a good time. She was a party girl. She went to college, and as soon as she got there, she like fell in love with the nightlife scene. Dropped out of college to work the door at the club, we've all been there, and made a ton of friends doing that. That's how she met Jimmy, that's how she met all her friends. She ended up really wanting to move to Houston. I guess that's like the closest big city with like a good gay scene, because that's where she wanted to be. Gay scene, nightlife, that's everything she wanted. So she went to Houston, moved there, met Cliff, and they clicked pretty quickly because they were both into the party scene, they both did coke. Patrice did a lot of ecstasy and Cliff did a lot of cocaine, so they made a pretty good couple because they were always like level 10,000 together. So one night after clubbing, Patrice is 20 years old at this point and Cliff is 31 years old at this point, and Jimmy was also 20 when Cliff started dating him, so he has a thing for like controlling younger people and choosing them to be in the abusive relationship. So they go to a drag show in Arkansas and afterwards Patrice is like, yeah, you can come back to the place that I'm staying in and cuddle and they cuddle and then they start like this weird relationship after that and things just get wild from here, as if they're not already wild. Patrice definitely wasn't comfortable with Cliff's gender fluid presentation and presenting female most of the time. She had a problem with that. She made Cliff cut his hair and start working out to try to get rid of the breasts that he had grown from taking those hormones on and off for a few years. She also kept their relationship a total secret from all of her friends and she didn't admit ever that they had touched each other more than just like handshakes and hugs. When Cliff was talking about this part of his life with Catherine, that author again, he said, Said, Patrice showed me for the first time that sex wasn't about control, but it could be pleasurable too. What an alarming thing for somebody to say. That is just straight up 
sociopath, like rapist, murderer, check that off, put him in an institution. I mean, I guess at this point she was interviewing him from prison. Spoiler alert, all is not well. December of 1985, Patrice ends up pregnant, which puts a big strain in the relationship and makes Cliff start being super weird towards Patrice because he wants to have this kid with her and raise this kid and start a family. And he's introduced her to his parents and they approve because they're homophobic and they're glad that Cliff is with the woman. So he's kind of just obsessed with this idea of keeping Patrice with him forever. And Patrice is already showing signs of being like, I'm kind of over this. And she was never the relationship type. She even said that. So her friends notice that Patrice, for the first time ever, is starting to exhibit symptoms of anxiety, and she's telling them now verbally that she wants to leave Cliff, but she doesn't want to hurt his feelings. All of this is probably due to the craziness that Cliff is inflicting on her. He's already doing the same thing that he did with Jemmy. He's trying to get her away from all her friends and seclude her, isolate, and conquer. Plus the copious amounts of ecstasy and cocaine that they were consuming, I'm sure did not make this relationship very smooth at all. Cliff was aggressively protective of Patrice, and if he even suspected that somebody was hitting on her or looking at her the wrong way, he would bodily remove them from the club or wherever they were. He got in fights often, got a black eye one time, all because he thought Patrice was hitting on other people or somebody else was hitting on Patrice. It was, it's toxic masculinity. It's toxic masculinity. Let's be real. Masculinity. Things were getting wild, obviously, and one night at the old plantation, which seems like a problematic name for a club, Brandy was performing and she pointed at a railing that they had built around the stage, I guess to keep people from getting too close, and she said, do you guys hate this shit as much as I do? Something like that. And then pulled out a real live chainsaw, revved it, turned it on, this is how you do it, and then cut that banister into pieces. She was wilding if I've ever seen it. Three months into Patrice's pregnancy, she tells Cliff that she wants an abortion, and Cliff reluctantly takes her to go get that procedure done. By February of 1986, Patrice is telling friends, and she's already formulated this whole plan that she wants to move to Chicago with them and start a new life there, explore the clubs, do her Patrice thing in Chicago. But she tells them that Cliff is not going to be coming with them and that she's going to cut things off with Cliff. On March 4th, 1986, Patrice called her then friend Naomi Sims, Miss Gay America 85, and told her she was bored and that she wanted to go out that night with Naomi and their other friend. But apparently their other friend didn't really like Cliff, I wonder why. So later that night, right before the plans were supposed to start, Patrice called, sounding real timid, and was like, mm, is it okay if Cliff comes? And they agreed to let Cliff come along. Probably not a good idea. So Cliff, Patrice, Naomi, and their other friend here go to a club called Heaven halfway through the night while Cliff is literally hawkeyeing Patrice from across the bar. Patrice tells Naomi in the dressing room, Cliff is being a real bitch tonight. And Naomi's just like, girl, I can tell. And by 1 a.m. the show's over and Naomi's done hosting. So they pile in the car, Cliff drops everybody off, and then Cliff and Patrice go back to their apartment. At some point in the early hours of March 5th, 1986, Patrice LeBlanc was murdered she was stabbed 39 times, her left ear was nearly severed, she had stab wounds everywhere, and the fatal blow was a few inch long gash to the jugular, and she bled out. She had nearly no blood left in her body when she was dumped in Lake Livingston. Two and a half weeks later, a couple fishing found a bundle of sheets and stuff sewn together had floated to the top of the lake and it was very obviously a body. So they called the police and the body was unidentified in a morgue until March 30th. Her family reported her missing March 30th because she hadn't shown up for Easter dinner and they knew something was wrong. So police everywhere started looking in the morgues and the detectives found the unidentified body. It was identified as Patrice, ruled a homicide, and the investigation started. All of the suspicion turned to Cliff when they found the record of the abortion. I guess Cliff was listed as the father, and when they went to look for his whereabouts, they learned that Cliff had fled. And not only had he fled, but he had sold most of his most expensive possessions, including Patrice's possessions. And Patrice's things included an emerald ring that he had just got for her on Valentine's Day. Friends that were calling Cliff looking for Patrice in the time between the 5th and the 30th when her body was found, not found, but identified, Cliff would give them weird short answers like she's at the store or she's with friends. So all the suspicion was on Cliff and he's nowhere to be found. When Cliff got news that Patrice's body was identified and it had turned out that she was murdered, Cliff said, quote, Oh God. What will I do? Only worried about himself. Then he disappeared. Police later found him hiding in a hamper in his parents' house, and he had gone straight to New York right after he fled, 
and then over to California to his cocaine puppet friend, Waylon Flowers Place, a couple different states on his way back, and then to his parents' house in Houston where he was hiding out. Cliff had told friends in New York that somebody murdered his pregnant wife and was trying to frame him, so he had to lay low there for a while. He didn't stay long before he went to California, and again, didn't stay long before he went to Houston. So now he's arrested, he's in custody, and completely denying that he did anything to hurt Patrice. The papers had dubbed him the master of disguise because they knew he was a drag queen, so they were like, he could be anyone, anywhere, at any time. In reality, he had bleached his hair, but he still looked very much like Cliff. His trial began in September of 86, not very long after he was caught. He was caught right at the beginning of June. So just a few months later when the trial started, things once again got crazy. The prosecution presented drops of blood found in the room that Patrice stayed in in Cliff's apartment, on the carpet, on the corner of a door, and also a drop of blood that was found on one of Cliff's shoes. They used the fact that he had recently repainted and remodeled that room and that room only, changing the carpet, repainting the walls. Forensics at the time were not. Um, so they couldn't really establish that that blood specifically belonged to Patrice, but they were able to establish that the blood did not belong to Cliff. So somebody else's blood was on the floor of his apartment, and he was on trial for murder. And to reiterate the crime of passion and the violence of the crime angle, they presented the crime scene photos, and you could see defensive wounds on her hands where she had tried to grab the blade from Cliff, giving him ample time to decide not to continue stabbing Patrice 39 times. Cliff's defense was shit, so all the time that he was on the run was not spent looking for a good lawyer because the only thing that he presented was a photo of Cliff with Patrice with her arm around him. So, I mean, they took this picture together. How could he have killed her? It didn't take long for the jury to decide, just about an hour before they came back with the decision that Cliff was guilty on all charges and he was sentenced to life in prison. Cliff furiously maintained his innocence and told Catherine, no, I didn't kill her. I loved her. I wanted to marry her. There are many people who would never believe it, but for some reason we fell in love. He also told Catherine that she told him that she was just gonna leave one morning, that she needed time and space. That was his story. Patrice said she was gonna leave and he ran away. He was yucking it up in jail. He was performing his own one-woman version of women behind bars, pretending to be Nurse Ratchet and with his animal bags, party time boys, being nasty, thinking that he's funny when he's really not. Nah, thought he was having a great time. He's been there forever. He's still there right now. Nearly 20 years after first going into prison, Cliff's attitude had completely changed. He was no longer having fun. He was really regretting murdering a person. Cliff reached out to Catherine and told her that he needed to see her and speak to her. And when she got there, he astonishingly said, I lost control. Just an argument gone wrong. Totally my fault. I saw where anger can lead. Not a day goes by that I'm not filled with remorse. If I never left this place, I'd understand. I'll never truly get over what happened to her, nor should I. Just a sprinkle of accountability there at the end. It's so sad that he'll never get over murdering somebody. I feel so bad that he has to deal with all that psychological trauma that he put on himself. Oh no, Cliff, what are you gonna do? You're gonna die in prison. He was denied parole in 2011, which might be why he confessed in 2011, maybe thinking by the next time that he was up for parole, he would get out. 2016 came around, he was up for parole again. He did not get out. His record said that he's still a danger to society, basically implying that if he gets out, he's definitely gonna get back on drugs and definitely gonna go straight back to what he was doing before he went in. Catherine, 20 years later, couldn't help but to ask, are you suffering from dissociative identity disorder? Cliff completely denied that, and he said, that's totally implausible and fictitious. I am not a Sybil or Three Faces of Eve. I was an actor. KT or Brandy was no different than any of the roles, male or female. They were all well thought out characters I created. I was always Cliff at the heart of it. No one else knew, I knew. I may have looked a little bit different, but I was always Cliff. And while creepily describing the murder to Catherine in this up reunion that they were having, Cliff said that there was no shouting, and Catherine just kind of, what? She told him that that just makes her picture silent rage, and then springing across the room and stabbing somebody 39 times, and then Cliff was like, oh no, 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 no. We fought, but we didn't shout. <laughs> Nuts. This one was a doozy. I hope you guys enjoyed that wild ride the same way I enjoyed that wild ride when I was researching it. I know this case was wild, but if you didn't know about it, I had to tell you about it because it's it's worth it. I'm glad that Patrice got her justice in the end. I'm glad that her family has that closure, and I'm glad that this person is still behind bars doing time because that's not something we see often, and I'm glad that we see it in this case. It's transformation time.
That's the look for this week. Flappery flapper. I kept saying the word swanky, so it had to be swanky. Yeah, it's from Spirit of Halloween. Yeah, the Halloween stores are open. Yeah, I got my ostrich feather from there. And this, cigarette holder. But I don't smoke cigarettes and it's 2020, so. 2020. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed this crazy f story this week. If you don't know, you should know that this show streams live every Monday. Out at TV does a live stream of my backlogged episodes Mondays at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I should quit while I'm ahead. I look pretty. That's all I have going for me. I hope I gave you all the information I was supposed to give you this week. I know I flashed this bag of nails and then didn't put it on, but I ran out of nail glue. And what is a girl to do? I only have so many pairs of gloves. I'll see you guys next week.